we had a big function. I still remember walking into the room and it was amazing because it was the 96 and the 1990 to 96 or 88 to 96 crew. Delaney, Geneva, Biachi, I think Hodges might even have been there. Um, it was all that crew and to see their elation because you remember that those are the guys that were, had to perform when Port tried to get the SNF, uh, leave the SNFL and go to the AFL. So not only was it for us under a new jumper, same club under a new jumper with Teal on it, it was a connection to the past where all these people that had done all the hard lifting got rewarded for what we'd able to do. Hey guys, I'm just about to chat to the one and only Warren Treadbury, Port Adelaide legend. Speaking of Treaders, there's a big event happening on the Saturday of Gather Round. Treaders and Matty Richardson, the Richmond legend himself, uh, they'll be down at the Gov doing a sportsman's event. Find out more details, go to Talking Talent Facebook page or the Gov Facebook page and it's going to be a ripping event uh, in the lead up to Port Adelaide's big game against the Dogs. A big shout out to Pete Oldfield and the Southern Slugs Football Club for sponsoring this episode. Uh, they've got a really good event happening the June long weekend over there in Bali. Uh, anyone that's keen for over 35s, 45s and 55s footy, there's AFL Masters. It's going to be a huge weekend. I wish I'd get over there myself. Yeah, get involved in that. Go to Southern Slugs Facebook page to find out more about it. Good on you. Well, what an absolute pleasure it is to have Warren Treadway on Sports Legends with Bevo for the very first time. How you going, Bevo? Trent, it's great to have you. Um, obviously, last Saturday, a huge win by our boys, the power against the Lions. Certainly didn't see that coming, especially after half time. I was in the 5 double A box. No one saw that coming. I don't think anyone on the ground. The Adelaide Oval was as quiet as I've ever seen in a, a Port Adelaide game, but I think they conceded seven of eight goals and until Charlie Dixon kicked that one late, you thought, oh, I gave them a bit of hope, but then kicking the next 12 or 13, it was, yeah, it was uh, Rioli's hangar and it was quite the festival and Jason Horn Francis brought his own footy, so it was good to see. And the season ahead, obviously, one round in, so it's a long way to go. Do you see the power playing finals this year? Well, I didn't see him winning on the weekend, and I look at the eight and go, who could drop out? And then I was thinking, this is a few weeks back, I was thinking, maybe Collingwood's the slider. Not from what I saw the other <laughs> night. So I think it's going to be difficult. You look at Carlton, they were pretty good last year and then fell ever so short. Um, I think it was on percentage last year. Port Adelaide were really disappointing. Got off to a horror start, zero and five, then won the next five. But once you're zero and five, you're chasing your tail. So it, I think they've got the talent. Yeah, you know, it's just pretty much the same team that got to prelims the previous two years. So oh, I don't think there's excuses. I know there's a lot of pressure on Ken Hinckley and that'll take care of itself with wins and losses. The reality is it's between their ears. Are they mentally, they're physically good enough. They've got enough talent. Are they mentally good enough to deal with the rigors of the season and then the expectation that comes with the finals. And let's go back to your own footy journey, traders, because obviously you had an illustrious career, four Australians, four Jack Cale medals, the list goes on. Tell us about your junior footy and, and through the ranks to, to playing for Port Adelaide, you know, not only in the sample, but also the AFL. Yeah, well, I was an Eagles zone boy. I went to Grange Primary, went to St. Michael's. But even I was sort of the black sheep at school because uh, in that case, all the boys went off to the Eagles. So I played juniors at the Eagles to under about under 14s and then went to Port because Dad played at Port Adelaide and had uh, been a senior player, a runner, a selector under the John Carl era. And I was one of those kids that every long weekend in October, they asked what you're doing. I said, I'm going to watch Port in a grand final because in my time as a kid there, it was 88, 89, 90. Crows come in. I signed on as a member for the Crows, but to support the opposition, I was a West Coast supporter. <laughs> then they won 92, 94, 95. And then I was lucky enough to play in 96 as a 17-year-old. So I was always a Port boy, just kid who just you know got through school tried hard but I was trying a lot harder at footy <laughs> played cricket first 11 for um, St Michael's played a bit with the Grange Cricket Club as well so I was always an active kid like athletics went off to the nationals for that once for high jump and hurdles um, but yeah it was just one of those kids that just love sport you know if you could you know even at one stage I think the man and brother are, uh, you know, you're, you're competitive with marbles like yeah, it was just one of those things you know we just as a kid you just love playing sport. Um, I got two younger sisters and older brother, um, mum and dad, and mum was, remember the Nissan Vanette used to go everywhere from my sister's gymnastics to my brother's hockey at one stage. I played a year of hockey to our footy, to our cricket, everywhere. So mum was the full-time taxi uh, with four kids. Dad was working down the wharf, so we we're probably the Port Wharfy, so to speak, even though he was probably more in allocation and, and management there. But for me, I had a great childhood and uh, ended up uh, in under 15s, went and uh, played for Port Adelaide in the uh, Sandboy Cup, I think it was back then. It was lucky enough then as a 
uh, a kid in the heading into the under 17s because it wasn't under 18s then. And Russell Ebert, the legend, the late legend uh, for Port Adelaide and probably greatest greatest ever player at Port, and superstar of SA footy. He was running the um, under 17 Till Cup program. Got into that, played some good footy. Lucky enough to get all Australian as a kid and played against. It was amazing. You look back now at the time. Brent Harvey was in the Vic Metro team. Simon Prestia Combo, Lance Whitnell, I think Clinton King played a bit with uh, Collingwood and maybe even Richmond, Paul Acuria, Sydney, or Apunda, West Coast. <laughs> and we we're actually lucky enough to beat them in 95. We had Paul Evans, uh, Tommy Carr played, uh, certainly uh, premierships locally with the Maggies, Jared Crouch, uh, Stewie Cochran, where uh, Peter Bergon was going to play with us and then he did a U turn and went back to Northern Territory. Oh. <laughs> so for, for us, it was good. And then my journey started as Port Adelaide as a junior. and. Uh, within sort of playing Neil Till Cup 95. By 96, I was lucky enough to play something like eight games in the 19s, nine games in the reserves and the last nine in the league and won a premiership at 17. So that was my journey, Western Suburbs boy, and didn't go too far and then was lucky enough to sort of springboard into the AFL and and not move too far anyway. I have pretty much grew up at Grange, lived at Henley, and I'm at Westlake Shaw now. So <laughs> I'm caught in the West in the 5-0 numbers, 5 0 at the moment. Now, mate, I actually had a younger brother myself and I've got a younger sister too and had some cracking backyard cricket games, basketball, you name it. No doubt a few of those and uh, pretty competitive growing up as well with your brothers and sisters. Yeah, there's all that, absolutely. And it's funny, we we're lucky enough to come from a pretty good sporting background. Like Dad played league football and 19 games at Collingwood then had the plan to travel all around Australia um, because he wasn't with a well-to-do rich family. So he grew up in Reservoir of Victoria, which is sort of a pretty rough area. Collingwood area and then Collingwood said they wouldn't cover any injuries that was when they were really struggling and he sort of played with people like Peter McKenna and all this and um, then came to Port Adelaide thought he'd travel around Australia and then go to WA Northern Territory to sort of see a bit of Australia and travel but he got to Adelaide went to Port Adelaide married mum had four kids and has never left many many years <laughs> later so yeah that was all the the, the journey and then even dad's sisters uh, both played cricket for Australia and once in the uh, MCC Hall of Fame Sharon in the Australian Cricket Hall of Fame so Sharon was the women's cricket captain uh, back in the day when they had to take six to eight weeks work off to go and represent the country. And I think she played something like 30 tests and was the fastest bowler in her generation. So I ended up uh, batting against her at Richmond Nets one day when we she flew us over to watch some cricket and went for a holiday. But yeah, even then at 30 odd, she uh, could zing them through. So yeah, we've sort of come from lucky stock and hardworking stock, if you know what I mean, with, with sport. Yeah, that's unbelievable, the story, for sure. And speaking of unbelievable stories, I know you touched on it before, but 96 as a 17-year-old, talk us through winning a flag, uh, you know, and playing with the idols that you grew up, you know, going along to watch as well. Yeah, it was it was unbelievable. Like, I, as you know, I still do some work with a guy at the moment, Timmy Ginova, who was my captain at the time. Yeah, Roger Delaney, who only a couple of weeks ago when Roland Smith got inducted into Port Adelaide's Hall of Fame, um, you throw in uh, Lees, Fiacci, Hodges, who was my favourite player, he was the one that Gary McIntosh wanted to knock my head off. He uh, he he looked after me. So Darren Smith, Rowan Smith, like uh, ball A's, There was yeah, you know, just a star-studded lineup from anyone who, for me, being a Port boy, grew up watched them win multiple premierships, some seven, some eight. Pulling off East, I think, ended up winning eight or nine. So that was a dream. Um, and as a seventeen-year-old in his ninth game, it's sort of yeah, it was unbelievable. And and obviously, two thousand and four, you skipped Port Adelaide, Port Adelaide's very first AFL premiership, and. You know, not many people tip that tread. There's going into that game, obviously the Lions were going for four in a row, red hot favourites. Um, were you feeling like on the on the morning of the game, like, yeah, we can do this? Or you just, did it completely come as a surprise what happened? No, you always, as a professional sports person, you always think you can win. And even in the case when the club was really struggling towards the end, you come up, I remember, well, even a few years before that, actually in 2000, we played this and then here they were undefeated. In your mind, you can still create a reason why you can win. If we do this well, we can do this. But we were very confident, but we were, um, we knew the pressure was all on uh, Brisbane. They were going for four in a row. We probably had the moral support from the Victorian crowd because I think Collingwood had got four in a row in the 60s or 70s or something. And so that, that whole thing was winding up in Victoria. They don't want the other three ex-Fitzroy slash Brisbane Lions to take over. But we were super confident and we also felt because we'd finished top, you know, we'd won more games than Brisbane in that journey. We just didn't execute in finals. We'd had two poor finals. First year, I think it was against Collingwood, lost the home final. Then the following year, it was Sydney. I think we gave them a four or five goal head start and we fell just short. So that was our own doing, uh, albeit those teams played very well at the time. But we knew we just didn't bring our best. And part of that is your opposition. Part of that is your own performance. And we just knew that 
we were good enough. We'd beaten Brisbane over the journey and we knew that, you know, our fitness and our ability to run out the game if we execute. We knew at half time, that's all Choco was screaming about. I remember now, you know, we got them, we're going to run over them. They're worn out. And we're able to do that and win by about seven goals. So that was just amazing. And, you know, and the, the, the difficult bit, you know, I, you say I'm the premiership captain, I was acting. You know, Matty Primus was out injured. Josh Franco was another out injured. Stewie Cochran and a few others that were so close to selection just missed out. Um, and that was sad. But for the whole club, it was an amazing, uh, amazing time. And it just, you know, you look back now and, it's almost coming up 20 years. Like, it's just it's gone so quick. Yeah. And who led the best on ground celebrations uh, when you won the flag? Well, it, it sort of went through uh, spits and spurts. It was, I oh, know I didn't sleep the first night, apart for about 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> I was in some heat nightclub with Wendell Saylor somehow was there. I don't know. He, he, was, he, was, he was supporting Brisbane. Um, the, the reason why he was around is that my kicking coach, Ben Perkins, ex-Adelaide boy, work with the Wallabies and that's how he he knew him so <laughs> boys were sort of yeah it was, it was part of it I don't know it was that much going on it was almost like with one it was like whoa what do we do now I, I do vividly remember there was the function uh outside the Carlton Crest uh hotel where we used to stay on the on the uh, banks of the Yarra uh opposite the casino and we had a big function I still remember walking into the room and it was amazing because it was the 96 and the 1990 to 96 or 88 to 96 crew, Delaney, Geneva, Biarchi, I think Hodges might even have been there. Um, it was all that crew and to see their elation because you remember that those are the guys that were, had to perform when Port tried to get the SNF, uh, leave the SNFL and go to the AFL. So not only was it for us under a new jumper, same club under a new jumper with teal on it, it was... A connection to the past where all these people that had done all the hard lifting got rewarded for what we're able to do so that was huge uh i still remember yeah there was some some big days um the sunday was huge i think we bucky cunningham lied to us he told us the fans are ready 10 o'clock we're gonna unveil yeah we got off the plane at 8 30 thought no worries that didn't happen till two because there <gasps> were just people going everywhere so we got blokes who haven't slept played a grand, grand final <laughs> sleeping on the high jump mat no one could get near each other. They were sleeping on jump mats and everywhere in the gym and what you think was a grand. And then you had the others who were just starting to fire up again. But then I think we headed down to the Broadway that afternoon and that poor place has probably never been the same down at Glenelg. So <laughs> they were good times. And But it, it moved so quick because I still remember on the Thursday, Josh Carr told us he was heading home. Damien Hardwick had accepted a job and retired. Damien Hardwick had accepted a job with Alastair Clarkson and he left just earlier. And all of a sudden it, it turns very quickly and, you know, that Friday was the best and fairest. We had a good celebration. Then I flew out uh, to America with a mate at the time to head away for a holiday. And, yeah, everyone sort of, some boys went to Cairns on the footy trip. It was sort of everywhere and everywhere. And with those times, you, you book your trips a fair way out. And before you know it, it's a month, two, month and a half, two months later, uh, you're back at training starting again. So, Yeah. <laughs> It feels like it goes way too quick. I still remember the celebrations, the lap of honour. Apparently went for 45, 50 minutes. It feels like two minutes. Yeah, I mean, it was just, yeah. it was a great time and something, hopefully I don't uh, forget my uh, memories. Uh, you just hope you can re remember it forever because it was a great time and we spent a lot of time working hard to get there. And obviously, towards the latter end of your career, Treaders, uh, you mentioned before how things go from good to bad and there's some really tough times for the club and obviously the, the tarps came out and we weren't getting the crowds for the games and, and then Primus was coaching for a while there. Uh, talk us through those days where you were close to your career and how things were going pretty tough and then obviously going forward, things have changed since then, thankfully. Yeah, well, I'd been going back a few years before that. I'd had a knee injury and I'd always recovered. I'd had four dislocated knee injuries. So, you know, start on my right recovered quickly then my left had a bit of damage right a bit more damage so my my right was a bit crunchy but then my left one i had a major issue and it was just that i inherited the number one i'd actually been named captain in 2006 year so that sort of knocked me for six and spent two or three years getting back then had a really good year one of best and fairest in 20, 2009 then 2010 in round seven uh tried to chase alwyn davy of all people who was super quick maddie thomas comes out of nowhere tackles him wipes out my leg i've done the old full reconstruction syndesmosis on my leg never played again nine weeks later that was the last game we won before mark williams was sacked so that changes a lot club makes the tough call there's financial issues for the club matthew promise is put in 
uh, as a caretaker coach. I haven't played. I've retired. I've got into the media, and all of a sudden, yeah, they're able to to go through that. And that was tough times because you know I remember my first time working in the commentary box. I was working for Triple M, working for the advertiser, and did some stuff with Nine uh, with the news and. And we're rewarding best players for blokes who gave their effort. Yeah, no one was playing outstanding. Now now you're at Port's head of stage and a few years later under Ken Hinckley coming in, David Kosh coming in, um, you're able to rule, yeah, talent is starting to evolve. But back in those days, it was sort of just heavy lifting. You know what I mean? They couldn't really get a free agent come on board. If they did, they will recycle players. You know, weren't spending the full amount of the salary cap. That was tough. And the fans were sort of staying away because in a way, I can understand they were disgruntled. They didn't see while on the field replicated what they loved in Port Adelaide. But I do want to highlight the Brett Duncanson board. There's a lot of people who maybe not be back at the club now, and it cost them a lot of money individually. They supported the club unbelievably. As much as Adelaide can tell you all they want, I know what it went on. They were the ones that instigated with the AFL and the Sacker to get football into Adelaide Oval. The Crows didn't want that to happen. They were happy at West Lakes because uh, Mike Rand, the Premier at the time, and Kevin Foley said, yeah, we're going we're gonna to fix up. Um, footy park we're not going to move and I still remember someone said to me and this is not to be offensive they said uh, you can't put lipstick on a pig it's still a pig and footy park was unbelievably well but the whole thing needed to be if you look at modern stadia it needed to be upgraded we know we've got an Adelaide Oval now and that's coming up 10 years old it's, yeah. but it's world class and even that yeah. now has to continue to be invested in because you know, we see what happens in Perth that's amazing the MCG's now getting another refurb um, we're also seeing Marvel get refurb with the government so uh, the Gabra will get a new stadium with the Olympics coming up. So I, I think that board that went through it, they went through hell. You know, it was under Sandful ownership, fighting with their Sandful. AFL won't step in because it's not their product. And I had a discussion the other day that talked about the distribution from the AFL and the clubs get, and I think Pro- Port's now in the top quartile or, you know, support when they label bottom back then. Yeah, you know, and that's how different the, the game has changed. But, you know, enter the AFL, then effectively threw out that board on a grand final morning, a lot didn't see it coming. It's pretty brutal. And then a new board's been put in, led by David Kosh, who's on Sunrise. All of a sudden, you know, it was a pretty favourable fixture at the start of the year. Port go five and zip. And then the next five, Ken Hinckley's put in. Darren Burgess has come back from Liverpool. Alan Richardson's the head of coaching. A year later, Phil Walsh has put in. So all of a sudden, they're able to you know, rebuild and rebrand this club. Phil Walsh and Dean Bailey, well, Phil Walsh had pretty much said he was coming back a couple of years earlier for Matthew Primus and changed the minute when West Coast come and offer a fortune. So that was the difference between the haves and the have-nots. But to see where Port Adelaide's gone, yeah, it's it's good to see. Um, but it's a game that keeps giving and you've got to keep performing and you keep lifting and the standards got to keep going. So those times were tough. You know, people laugh about the tarp stuff. Yeah, it is, but I think they'll make an hundred grand a tarp. So it wasn't all bad. <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind putting a tarp out for hundred grand. I reckon, exactly. Yeah. And obviously there's been so much talk recently, Traders, about the prison bars. Um, you know, being such a, a great Port Adelaide player and Port Adelaide person that you've been for many years and your dad mentioned before played for the club. Why is it so important, you think, for the players wanting to wear the prison bar guernsey? Yeah, I think, well, is it that important for the players? I don't know. You'd have to ask them. For me, who was a player at the time, I wore it in 03, loved it because I'd played in that jumper, but it wasn't the same jumper. It wasn't the lace-up I was taught by a senior player, come here, this is how you lace it up. That was always the way that Port, Port Magpies and, or Port Adelaide Footy Club, who were the Magpies then. Um, so there was that tradition and it was really heavy if it got wet, and, but I, I get it. It was great to wear it. But I'm also not one of those, you know, I, I love my club, but I'm also not oblivious and blinkers on where I go, well, we are the power now. And if you read the Constitution of Heritage, how it happened, Port was going to leave the Sandful. The Sandful wanted to stay, so the Port Magpies were created as a club, but they adopted the old Guernsey. The team that won the licence went to the AFL, but I've got a new Guernsey. So that's where the mixture is, and I think the one a club alignment now helps, whereas you're not competing against each other, because at one stage there, they were almost very... It, was, it got a bit ugly, because they were all competing for the dollar, and the power even at competing against the Crows for a dollar. So... I love the fact that Port gets to wear the Guernsey. I love it's only one. And it's only this year. There's no deal done. So as much as I'm a bit sceptical with it all, because I, I, I want to hope that it, it is one from here on in, in Port's home showdown, uh, once a year, the Adelaide. Not twice, not every game. I know some people say we should wear it and stuff Collingwood. No, no, we entered the AFL knowing that this is a deal. They struck a deal with Collingwood. And even Eddie Maguire said on Footy Classifieds, uh, I think it was about 12 months ago, they effectively entered the deal in 
not in good faith because they knew that Heritage Round was not going to be allowed. And Port had just signed with, uh, it was 2007, we get to where in header Heritage Round. Uh, Collingwood agreed, but Collingwood knew Heritage Round wasn't going to go ahead. I love the fact that Jeff Brown, now the, the chairman of, uh, or president of Collingwood, the CEO, Craig Kelly, are moving on. It's not about a tit for tap, Koshy versus can agitate Maguire. Maguire can agitate Koshy. And that's what it, I get that's the games they play. But I think for Port to wear it once, it doesn't affect Collingwood. They can make a little bit of money out of it. They're not doing it for money. Some people commercially go, yeah, we're making money out of it. You know what? I'd love for them to do it. And you, you, know, you sell them for cost. I think it's an, yeah, it's, but I, I get they want to make a dollar out of it because it's a competitive industry. I wouldn't even, I've been told it's not the case. I wouldn't be surprised if Collingwood got a cut. I've been told that certainly isn't the case. But I, I love the fact you can look after your heritage and one of the Guernseys you wore. Yeah. Like I wore the magenta one, I wore the bananas in pajamas one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and, you know, I, I think that's great. You know, and my sons, they, they want to get my dad's number 15 Magpies one with a shiny jumper. He's got that in a the cupboard. They put that on. They grab my number 56 out. Like, <laughs> and for me, does that mean much? No, it means much that it cares for my kids and they respect where that's from and their dad and their pop wore it, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. It's nothing about this beating the chest. It's the fact that, okay, if this is my, my, my kids, yes, we're aligned, but even if a kid, like, oh, it's funny now, you used to get introduced to, Younger girls who are your age and parents and sign autographs for kids your boys your age. Now, when you're my age, coming up 45, you, you do photos with grandmas and then you get people go, oh, this was the guy that used to play. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> but for me, it's all about your brick in the wall. And whether it's Collingwood, Carlton, Essendon, Manchester United, Arsenal, play one game, play 1,000 games, Cristiano, Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, Wayne Carey, greatest ever, you still have a contribution to the game. And for me, that if you can pass on that heritage and where you've come from, and Port Adelaide has always been a workman club. It's always been based at Albert. And you know, a lot of the workers are on the wharfs and uh, all that sort of stuff. And, and that's why the never so die attitude is always sort of either line with, one dad aligned with it. I grew up with it. I've passed that on to my kids. Yeah, one's a massive surf lifesaver. One loves his footy. One, doesn't, one does dance. One doesn't even care. You know what I mean? But they all go, oh, it's footy. Why well, aren't we going? Because they associate... <laughs> as the culture of going to the footy. And I think that's the most important bit. Yeah. And if you can pay respect to your heritage, and even Collingwood would sit there and go, yeah, you've got to remember too, most Collingwood fans were Port fans. Exactly. They're probably Juventus fans and Newcastle fans and Adelaide City fans and because it was the black and white. Yeah. Um, so I think most people wouldn't care. But ah. it's just got a bit pathetic and pedantic over the journey. And finally, common sense has prevailed. Once, once a year, I think, in the showdown, Port's home showdown, perfect. I agree with you. Yeah. Leave, leave it that way, for sure. Now, Treaders, you've just started a new podcast recently called The Big Deal with uh, Dion Heyman and also Monty, Andrew Montesi over there in the US. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Uh, well, for us, it was, it was a bit going on in our working life for a couple of us. Um, so we just wanted to, we enjoy interview, we enjoy a bit doing a bit of media. So for us, The Big Deal, you can, Check it out on uh, pretty much any podcast platform. And, and for us, it's about the deals of sport. Like, you know, when, when Beckham left Real Madrid, you know, I mean, Real Madrid paid 30 odd million pounds, which is nothing nowadays, right? Average players go for 30 million pounds now. But they paid for the jersey sales inside three months. So for us, it's like a, a, a mixture of business and sport. There's a lot of business people that go to the footy on the weekend or sport go, oh, what does everyone want to know? They want the quotable and memorable. They want to know the story from the change rooms. They want to know what the locker room, you know, the coach's box, or how much someone's earning or how, how this deal happened. You know, when Dusty Martin re-signed at Richmond, how did that happen? How's he become the face of Bonds? So for us, our whole uh, situation around that is uh, interviewing guests who you know, open up different doors. You know, we've got an interview coming up on the Super League War for Rugby League talking through how the Adelaide Rams were created. I remember watching Adelaide Oval was sold out before it was oh, redeveloped. That was the best. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. And this interview, I won't say who we're talking to, but that'll come out. But this guy's actually got, I think, the jersey patent now because that's gone away. It's really interesting stuff. And for us, you know, I want to, and I've reached out to him and we'll talk in time, but Trevor Hendy. Trevor oh. Hendy went from Kellogg's to Nutrigrain, no, Nutrigrain Kellogg's to um, Uncle Toby. I remember the Uncle Toby Super Series. Same here, Guy Leach and kid. Trevor Hendy. A absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I want to talk about how that happened and how yeah. they were approached. Um, we've talked about, uh, I've spoken to Greg Chappell, spoken to Greg Chappell uh, about uh, all things, nine commentary box, working with Richie Benno, Kerry Packer. Also, 
how World Series cricket started, why he left South Australia to go to Queensland, because his brother was captain. He never thought he'd get a chance to lead and eventually ends up leading. What happened with the underarm incident? All about the financial elements. And, and then even to know that, for example, they might get, I think they're getting $200 a test. Australian cricketers get 14000 a test, <laughs> plus half a million dollars, plus... Blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? It's quotable, it's memorable. So for me, yeah. it's all about the journey of sport and where it goes. You, know, you talk about, you know, I might probably get someone on at AFL about granting AFL licences and really talk through all that sort of stuff. I reckon it'd be really interesting, really interesting stories to tell. So for us, it's little bits and pieces. There's a story around today about Pat Cummins and how he's gone out about it against Origin Energy as a major sponsor. You talk about, find guests to talk about different niches. You know, rugby league's really interesting with state of origin, the amount of money those guys earn. So for us, it's all about not only like, oh, someone signs five years. Okay, how did they pitch it? What did they do? Where did they go? And because I'm a sport nut at heart, I love sport. I'm a fan of sport. You know, I love sport news, but also with our podcast, we're doing it for the good reasons. You know, podcasting's good fun. It, it's heavy lifting, but it's offering long format. I grew up with the days of watching Sunday night, 60 minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. Six, you know, that is a different program now than what it was. But you look at what happens now. Everything is now Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, yeah. audio grabs, headlines, don't match the story. And this is the media revolution in my time the last 15 years. I love the fact that you can get your info very quickly from a Twitter, and especially now that Elon's released the chains and now you're getting all sorts of stuff coming through. So you actually got more of an informed um, opinion. But on the other side too, like A4 Clubs are a classic example. They put out their own in media. They only put out their own good media. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. With the Essendon saga, how much did Essendon put out? Not much. Not much. With a, yeah. you know, even our team, Port Adelaide. Oh, it just happened to find out Travis Boke tw- uh, last week had cracked ribs. Well, they didn't know that in the first two scans they had the previous week. They might not have. But uh, me being the media ex-news person, you're, you are sceptical how this rolls out. So I love the fact that podcast and particularly what we do on The Big Deal and like you do as well, you give a long format. You can list it on one and a half to two times and get through all your info. And oh, I think the podcasting format is, is a beautiful one because, you know, if you like the in- interview, yeah, great. If you don't, that's fine. You flick on, you watch on. I know Cornsy, Graham Corns at 5AA has been doing it for years. Hearing people's stories is interesting. So true. Because it, 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 there are so many similarities with what people have in business or sport or life or challenges with, you know, you look at personal lives and divorces and kids and you know, there's all these things. Information can help you. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really interesting thing to get involved in. Such an interesting point you raise as well there, Travis, because recently I interviewed Sam Pau Pepper, a great bloke, and obviously I'm sure you know him well. And it's so it's so interesting interviewing yourself post-career versus I'm sure what you would have been like when I interviewed you during your career and, and how robotic footy players can be. Yeah. Because they've got to be really careful how they answer questions and yeah. stuff. But then post-career, if I was interviewing Pep, say, in five, ten years' time uh, when he's finished playing, it'd be completely different. Yeah, and so, I think also, too, the other bit that's, yeah, I, I did a lot of media. I enjoyed it when I was playing. I had a TV deal and a, and a um, radio deal pretty much that whole time, but it was all about footy. There was no personality, having fun and playing jokes or you know, doing it, which you can if you're involved in it full time. But it's all around performance. You don't want to give anything away, but you want to give some insight, but you don't want to compromise performance. You don't compromise your club. You don't compromise your sponsors. So you're pretty well guarded. You know, and, and, and I've had a bit to do with Sam, and I approached when he had a off- big off-field incident a few years ago when it was in the in the tough spot. Yes. I did the exclusive when I was with the Nine Network. And I wasn't just gonna, you know, if I wanted to, I could have just gone bang, 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 and you cut it up and you could make a poor kid look terrible. Yeah. But my pitch to him at the time was I will ask you every question. If you are not cap- happy with that question's answer, right? You can we can re answer and re record it. And there was an element of frustration angst with that because we were streaming it live back in the studio. It was going through the whole network. Who's who's listening? Who's doing this? And Melbourne were watching. And I was like, hang on, hang on. I'm not having this kid go under a bus. He's, don't know, really know that what the story was at the time. It's been a little bit, but one of the networks went hard at him, checked one side of the story, which you can't do as a journalist, and didn't check the other side. So they went and just got the, the person, the, the second witness, and accused him of something. But I wanted him to have a chance to talk. What I realised with all of this too is there was also a psychologist helping him. There was a media manager helping him. He, he was in a tough spot. And I know more for anyone 
any situation, you do the crime, there's going to be an element that do the time. But we also can't forget in the media industry, we're human. And I think that's the clickbait in the world has really struggled with that. You know, yeah. Just one size doesn't fit all with all this. And what I got was this kid had had a really challenging upbringing. He'd had some areas that, you know, no one else has gone past, but none of that's been reported. And now it's just wonderful and beautiful to see that now I think he's had one child. He may be you know, on the way. Yeah. Another one on yeah. the way. Yeah. yeah. He's met his partner. Yeah. <laughs> and this is where it's funny. From Port Fan, playing the best footy he's ever played oh, in his no. life. <laughs> yeah. Set in his role, just yeah. re-signed on his extension. It's amazing how that life journey yeah. can be in a happiness journey. And I heard Craig McRae talk about that the other day on 360. So, so true. Um, yeah, yeah, it's... It, it was good where you see this kid where he's come from, and every time I see him, he always comes out his way, "Hey, go on, nice," because oh, he really knows nice. that not, not not that I was ever going to stitch him up, but there are times when people need some help. Yeah, and and it's great to see this kid, and I, I've really had nothing to do with the kid since, you know, apart from an interview. And Ken Hinckley clearly loves him. He clearly loves Ken. He clearly loves the club. He's clearly set, um, loves his partner. He's got a, his whole life has changed upside down since having yeah. one child. You can tell he's girl. so much happier. Yeah, you? and that's yeah. where it comes back to, which can be yeah. a beautiful thing because, you know, yeah. as you say, if you're happy in life, the rest takes care of itself. And that's a great example of where there can be an influence in media stuff that really gives some insight because there's a lot of people who have gone through, as Chucky used to say, everyone's got a story to tell. Someone's family got a cancer. Someone, kids, hasn't sick and been in hospital. You haven't slept. You're carrying an injury. But when he was, he said, everyone's got a story to tell. When you come to the white line, you got to leave that story, just park to the side, and then you got to go and play. Yeah. Yeah, that's no, a really good insight. And it's, it, you're right. When he spoke to me recently, he said, being a dad has just turned his life around. And yeah. it's just so great to see. And you're right, he's playing such good footy. Hey, before I let you go, you're also involved now with the North Adelaide Roosters. Oh, the, yeah. The, the old arch enemy back in the day. Uh, interesting seeing you in the red and whites now. Uh, what's your involvement down there, Travis? Oh, uh, it was, it was um, as you probably would have seen, I applied for Port's board and they, um, yeah, they wanted me to go at the end of the year, but I was applying for a position now that Darren Cale vacated. Um, but I was pretty much suggested that I'm not up for that. So no now and maybe yes later, which was disappointing. But the reality is, with uh, one of my best mates from footy is Jacob Surgeon. When uh, all the mandates and they were really restricted last year with all competitions and you know even the AFL clubs, cameramen can't get inside this or do that because they were quarantining the clubs. Same thing happened in the Sample, but as soon as everything lifted, Jacob Surgeon said, come out, I want you to come work with our young forwards. And I said, oh, yeah, just make sure everyone's okay with it because you don't want to tread on anyone's toes. He goes, no, 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 we're all good. I've told them I want this, I want that, I want this. Went and worked with them and did a couple of days and loved it. They are really receptive. You know, when you're, you're a semi-professional league and you look out and go, oh, he, oh, he can help us. Oh, God, he's got some ideas. And, you know, for me, I've had 30 years of footy knowledge, 15 as a player, 15 years in media and seeing what I see in the game evolve. You have an opinion, whether it's right or wrong, you take what you can. And they were really receptive. Saw him play in the grand final. I was heartbroken for Serge. And even though I'm not North man, I'm still Port. But <laughs> the game's changed for me with Port. The Port Maggies I knew aren't around agree i yeah. mean like and yeah. i mean they are around the goonsies but there is no i find it uh, unbelievable that their recruiting zone which was all my good mates from the west coast port lincoln streaky bay all those guys peter Burgle and tom carr paul evans that's now nelwood zone which is like wow <laughs> and that was around the one club alignment and, and effectively the maggies are a twos team yeah, uh, AFL twos team, and and I hope they go really well. And I've gone to the grand finals; they've fallen just short those last three over the last ten or so years. But when North called, I went out and watched them. I was really impressed with the way they go about it. They are well run. Jacob's got them going very well. They coach very well. They're very clear. Their players are really well well listen. And I guess that surprised me, but it shouldn't surprise me because I hadn't been around the Sanford level. And then when he rang me after the Port Board stuff didn't happen. And I'd return to go back to doing some um, some work at Double A in footy and uh, appearances on Drive Show, and then sort of relief filling in with either Timmy or Rowie or away. They said, "Oh, well, I said, well, I'm not sure I can commit the time." He goes, "Well, no, all we want is every second week." I was like, "Oh, I nearly put my foot in and said I'll come every week, but <laughs> it, it could be that it goes every week." But I just go out. I've been to the trial game, saw and play the Port Maggies on the weekend, and they flogged them, and they're a very good team. And if there's anything I can do to help any young player, I still remember when I was a youngster. I met with Craig Bragley on Ligon Street. I met with Wayne Carey, had a phone call. I was trying to get better and they took the time out for me. And I always remember that for if anyone ever thinks that they can get something from me and if I can help them out, I think it's great. But 
Oh, yeah, I, I'm coming off some good form because myself and Brett Burton, we, we I was assistant coach, he was runner, and Toppy was our coach. The under-14s at Henley got up and won the... Uh, under... What was it? Yeah, under... 13s at Henley won the premiership last year, so we've got some good stock. So hopefully I can take that to North Adelaide. But no, it's just good fun. And yeah, we all love sport. I yeah. love my footy. But sometimes you're just away from it. And it's a unique opportunity to get involved at grassroots that maybe I wouldn't have before if I was working full time in the industry. And you've got a few export boys there as well, Aaron Young. And obviously. Um, Maury was yeah, the captain. Maury, Maury's the captain. He's Mitch got a Harvey. back injury at the moment, Mitch Harvey. So yeah, yeah. they've recruited work, uh, well. Um, uh, Mays is was North Adelaide, went to Brisbane, came to the power, Port Maggie's, and now he's back as a senior player there and development coach. So, yeah, yeah it's good. They're just a group that's really driven to win. Yeah. And yeah, from right what I there. saw, yeah. they'll be around the mark again. Yeah. Should be good fun. And I'll just cover more final questions before you head off, mate. Funniest teammate at the Port Adelaide Footy Club and why? Brad Ebert, because he's just a child and he's a good mate. And Shay Cockatoo Collins, he's just really funny. His personations were very good. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> were you involved with pranks back in, in the day as well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The funniest one we ever had was David Armfield. Our, um, Brent oh. Guerra was good at it too. I think Brent Guerra stole David Armfield's car in the back streets of Alberton. They hid it for a few days in the back streets. And they only lived out the back of Alberton. They couldn't find it. He reported it stolen. <laughs> they gave him the keys. As he started the ignition, the cop light went off thinking he's got the stolen car. <laughs> <laughs> Another one too is the same guy, poor Arnie. They got some strapping tape out of Dave Watkins, our then head trainer at the power, his thing, drove his car onto Alberton, left it in gear and just had the steering wheel locked with strapping tape with the window down and it just kept doing circling until it ran out of um <laughs> ran out of uh out, out of fuel and then he had to everyone had to do practice kicking on the oval and now his face lit up and i think one of the doors got dented but <laughs> yeah there's all sorts of funny ones um adam kingsley senior coach at now uh at gws had a mini moke he used to park it right at the front he got warned not to park at the front because that was the coaches the ceos the captains maddie promises car park and Leadership group had a few, and then he put it right at the front door, so the boys turned it sideways. So it was like um, Austin Powers, you know, couldn't get out. <laughs> that was always good. So, yeah, they're the things that you miss. You, you miss the fun with the boys. You miss the, as ridiculous as is, the ice packs after a win away from home when you're just exhausted and go, no one gave us a chance, but we won. You miss the antics of some guys. It's, yeah, it, it's no different to, you know, the boys catch up at talk at a barbecue and, you know, just talk footy and, talk fun you know what i mean and, and they're the bits you miss but yeah it's if you can get a workplace that has a bit of probably not that probably wouldn't go that far that day yeah. these days but yeah the face of david arm for the next day when we found out the cops had nearly arrested him <laughs> for a car that the boys hid from him that was funny oh, mate, i've been on a few footy trips in my time so i know what exactly what that's oh, all about yeah. so <laughs> and your toughest opponent obviously you played on some apps oh, yeah. games and half back so wow. yeah it, it, i remember playing on sylvani as a Younger guy, I was like 19. I pushed him. I thought, oh, I'm getting rid of him. Problem is his bottom half of his body didn't move and he was tough to play on. Ben Rutten was good. Scarlett was good. Um, bloody good players. I played on Jakovic as a kid. I remember got a few marks early and then three times in a row they kicked it along. I couldn't even move him. You know? And it was just that evolution as a kid. You were someone who wanted to avoid contact and then all of a sudden you could instigate to on contact when you're older. So they're all very good players. Darren Glass, um, take your pick. Glenn Archer, who was a lot shorter but super competitive. Yeah, I was lucky enough. So I played on the best defenders there were, and it was it was good fun. And it was you never knew it never came easy. And if you ever had a good day, you had to cash in because you knew it was going to be pretty tough next time. <laughs> yeah, I've been punched in the back of the head many times playing centre forward, Travis. Yeah, so, Mick Martin yeah. was early days. <laughs> yeah. Don't even think he went for the ball. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and just just a final one. Obviously, there's been a lot of talk about extra time versus keep the draw. Your thoughts? Keep the draw. Keep the draw. Yeah. And no, I'd love draw. for him to keep the draw at Green Final. I know that AFL made about 18 to 20 million last time that happened, but I think there's just something unique about it to say that if you ever had to keep the draw, I know the AFL's made the call now, it's extra time for a Grand Final. I get that from the other finals, so the finals aren't interrupted. But yeah, the draw's unique. We all walk away going, I still remember it was the year I retired. So if you're lucky to play 200 games, you get the motorcade, and I did that. Um, and then everyone was like, you get the good seats, the cushy seats for that one time. 
And everyone goes, what happened? I go, we're back next week. They're like, what? We're back next week? I said, if you buy the same ticket next week. <laughs> and the positive in that situation was, what was a 30% club crowd for the competitors? I think it was Collingwood and St Kilda at the time. The next next week, it was 70%. So all of the corporate tickets were fulfilled. So yeah, I'd love for that to happen, but I uh, don't think it'll happen. But keep the draw normally. Yeah, you know, it made us feel weird uh, on the first round on Thursday night. But that's okay. We've got another 23 games this year to play. Well said. Well, Travis, I can speak to you all day. Thanks so much for coming on Sports Legends with Bevo for a chat. Once again, the big deal. Check it out. It's a great podcast. And uh, keep up the great work, mate. Thank you.